There's a phenomenon that briefly lit up Reddit like a fire a few years ago called r slash plays. In this small section of the internet, we were given a tapestry of pixels and the ability to place one pixel at a time every five minutes. This privilege was extended to every person viewing the canvas and the canvas was shared by everyone. At first, it was chaos. For most people, a pixel that was placed would get replaced immediately and no progress would get made. As the progress continued through its 72-hour lifespan, teams of people came together to form images on the canvas and protect those images from rogue pixels. Every now and then, one of the teams would create a voracious black boy that would attempt to consume as much of the canvas as possible before eventually being beaten back. Groups formed and disbanded at the speed of thought, and art took form, producing the tapestry you see on screen now. When we set out to accomplish something, we have to manage our expectations. One person can only accomplish so much. Sometimes our goals are just too unrealistic, and we begin to ask the questions that are ever-present in life. On an individual level, nothing you do will ever matter. You might live your life from start to finish, and no one will ever care about you. Your pixel might be replaced the moment you put it down, no matter how hard you try to save it. Sometimes. You can't stop the oncoming tide of inevitability that is the rest of the universe. So, when the end does come for you, what will you do? Will you run from it, deny it, or face it head on? As one, nothing could be accomplished, but together we could form art. These are the thoughts that I was left with after completing today's topic, Enderal. Enderal is a fascinating game that tries to teach you this lesson over its 100 hour playtime. Where its big sister Skyrim will always place the player in the best position to try and pat you on the back every step of the way, Enderal is the cryptic sensei that will kick you while you're down if it means you'll learn from it. In Enderal's world, being the hero is not a good thing. In some ways, it's even hinted that something is wrong with those that think they are heroes. For Enderal, the nation that you've just fled to to escape a civil war, your arrival is the harbinger of the end. During this video, I want to explore how Enderal handles the concepts of inevitability and hope in the face of the apocalypse. For those who aren't aware of what this game is, it's a total conversion mod for The Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, that's been developed by Shore AI. If you have Skyrim, then you have Enderal. By most people's estimations, Enderal is the superior product, created as a labor of love by a huge team of volunteers on a non-existent budget, and I urge you to give it a try. However, if you've already played the game and are more interested in my analysis, you can find the chapter to skip straight to it. Through all of this, it never escaped my mind just how incredible it is that Enderal exists in the first place. I've played numerous mega mods in the past, and these sort of projects are true examples of what humans can accomplish together. The team that made Enderal, Shore AI, is a long-standing developer that began making these kinds of total conversion mods way back in the days of Morrowind. Enderal itself began development near the end of 2011. And it was then that we see one of the key figures that led this world's creation joining the team. For Nicholas Lietzow, Enderal Forgotten Stories is the culmination of eight years of hard work and frustration. One of the hardest parts of the project for him was how difficult it was to work with people who you couldn't promise pay for. This mod, like most modding projects, was a completely non-profit passion project. Nicholas and the 6 to 11 other members of the Shure AI team worked tirelessly to create the story that has, at this point, changed the lives of so many people, and all with the understanding that they wouldn't see a cent of compensation for their time. Entire new systems needed to be built, assets needed to be created, stories needed to be written. About half of the assets present in Enderal are brand new, and all of the voice acting and scripting was developed from the ground up. New creatures were added and a world was sculpted. This is why I call Enderal a game and not a mod. This is the scale of development required to bring something you love to life. It's the story of this game's creation that parallels the story within it, and they both amplify each other. 
Alone, we can barely accomplish anything, but together we can make art. Nothing describes the feel of Enderal quite like its beginning. The game opens with a dream. Unable to interact with the world except to move forward, you make your way up to the house in the distance. To one side is a burnt out ruin with nothing in it but a book labeled The Nutritiousness of Meat. In front of the house, you find Daddy, who greets you. The conversation that follows indicates you are searching for something, but exactly what isn't said. Heading inside, you hear a child laughing, but all of the doors are locked. One door is labeled the Forbidden Door. In the only open door, you find the massive larder and the elk that Daddy has caught. He starts to move towards butchering it. But when you ask him about your mother and sister, this happens. What? Now would you look at that? I totally forgot about them. They're dead, don't you remember? You murdered them back then, both of them. But hey, no use crying over spilled milk, right? At least this means there's more meat for the two of us. Oh, silly, what's this again? We both know that's a lie. You did it. I remember it all. First, you set this horrible fire to your sister's crib. She screamed and screamed, and Mommy heard it, but when she finally got there, nothing was left of her but burnt flesh. And... Oh, gosh, do we really need to go through this again? You know how sad it makes me when you do this. You killed them, period. No matter how often you tell me you didn't, it changes nothing. You hear me? Nothing. Right after you were born. No, yes, I should have killed you. I should have just killed you. Just like you killed us. And now, you think you're safe because we're all under the earth, don't you? Well, listen up, my child. You are wrong. And do you know why? Because the dead don't forget! Do you hear me? The dead don't forget! Now enough of this useless chatter! I'm bloody starving! Bring me the meat, you spoiled brat! Bring it to me! Bring me a nice crisp piece of meat! 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 After that, the opening cutscene plays and opens with What is the difference between a free man and a slave? With the obvious answer being freedom, you find yourself on a boat as stowaways. Character creation happens, you're discovered through strange occurrences and promptly dumped overboard along with your newly slain friend. Something wakes you up and you find yourself in a strange place. We'll get to that. You pull yourself out of it and are turned loose on the world. Enderal is not Skyrim, no matter how much they may look like each other. The game is balanced to be unforgiving and crushing. For at least the first few levels, you'll actually have to learn to evade enemy attacks or otherwise attempt to block damage. This works in the game's favor because you're no one special when the game starts. You're just someone who got tossed off a ship and was lucky enough to survive. Now you have a splitting headache and any attempt to use healing potions only seems to make it worse. You are not the hero, but you could be. The headache you feel is the arcane fever, one of Enderal's biggest differences to its Bethesda counterpart. Healing is no longer free. Drink too many healing potions and your flesh collapses as the realities of other worlds suddenly notice a hole through which they can come surging in. You are now in Urbaya. Good luck with the rest of your very short life. The only way to get rid of arcane fever is through ambrosia, which is both expensive and rare. As time goes on, you may be able to cure this scarcity, but for now, the best way to heal is just like your common peasant. Food and time. And it's these sort of changes that are all over Enderal. The gameplay beats you over the head repeatedly. You are not special. You can escape this feeling, but you absolutely have to work for it. And for that, you need skills. 
And for skills, you need skill books. Skill books are expensive, rare, and you can only get a few at a time every time you're in town. Every time you level, you gain points that you need when using them. As you get to the higher levels of any skill, the gold cost becomes prohibitively expensive, and you start to realize the true limitation was never the learning points. You can level as fast as you want, but until you're making bank, you'll never be able to spend all of those points. This is Enderal's way of telling you that you need to actually experience the world. And speaking of experience, nearly everything you do gets you experience points. Get enough and you get both skill points and a memory point. Memory points are used in this place. I'm sure it's fine. Anyway, this replaces the skill trees of Skyrim with a pseudo perk system. These perks can range from flat stat increases to new abilities. Actually, there's a lot of new abilities. Like, a lot, a lot. It's almost like Enderal really wants you to use those to balance out the unforgiving combat. All of this combines to create a world that you need to truly experience to become strong. Most of your experience comes from quests or exploration, and while you're at it, you start to get a feel for all of those new abilities. Combat begins to be about more than just hitting things with the biggest spell or the strongest weapon. You need to think to survive on Enderal. Once you begin to realize this, you're ready for... Enderal's quests can usually be described in one word. Bittersweet. While many of them vary in quality, the common theme running through all of them is finding a way to let go and move on. Sometimes you help someone find a way to proceed with their lives, or convince another person to let go of an old hatred. However, you are also frequently put in situations with hard or even impossible decisions that really mess with your moral compass. A common ending in Enderal's questlines is that there simply isn't a good outcome. A good example of this is the quest for the Brotherhood of Kor. You're sent out to an abandoned island that's been resettled by a group of upstart cultists to retrieve a worried mother's wayward son. It's while you're here that you discover things have gone very wrong. Some force took control, warping the minds of the men and eventually forcing the woman of the cult to attempt to flee. Deep underneath the island, you find the remains of the cultists, surrounding a demonic altar that usurped the cultists' own religion. With nothing left to do, all that's left is to return to the mother and choose how to report the news. There was nothing you could do. Her son is dead. Especially in modern RPGs, there's an overwhelming presence that developers need to give the players the chance for an optimal outcome. Enderal, and some other more recent RCRPGs, <laughs> Kingmaker, <laughs> aim to break that illusion. Bethesda's RPGs, in general, have a strange obsession with placing players in positions of power at breakneck speeds. You get to win the video game, but it also wrecks any sense of actually belonging to the world. Enderal forces you to take a step back and understand that not only is it hard to get the best outcome, but sometimes it's not within your capability. You weren't the chosen one. You were just some schmuck who happened to fit the bill and took on the quest. But that's not how every quest ends. Some of them are much happier. I'm on a quest. One quest begins with a down on his luck alchemist trying to find his old alchemy diploma. The story starts out with you finding out that he's never been to a real alchemy college, but instead took remote courses. Initially, we think he's been tricked, but it seems that the other end of the deal was telling the truth and sent him an actual alchemy diploma. The problem is, he lost it a while back when his pet minifig, Cuthbert, stole it. The problem with that is Cuthbert is dead, so you need to speak with the pig spirit to find where he hid it. And so begins the adventures of Sir Cuthbert, a small pig with big ambitions. It turns out all of this was started by the alchemist's interest in the very same woman who summons Cuthbert back to this planet of existence. And it seems Cuthbert knows this. What starts as a simple fetch quest turns into a matchmaking story where you and this guy's deceased pet 
trick the two would-be lovers into finally meeting each other. Everything ended incredibly well, but neither of them was willing to make the first move on each other. In a way, this is the complete opposite of the Brotherhood of Korn. Where that quest was guaranteed to end in sadness, this one is guaranteed to end positively. All that was required for either outcome was a daring adventurer to take the next step. In some way, this is common to all RPGs, but it's especially true for Enderal. You do change these people's lives in a way that's irrefutable. Remember that. It will be important later. You're not the only one who's trying to leave our mark on the world. This quest is mostly notable for its heavy nihilistic themes, though with the same Enderal traits I've outlined above. During it, you help a traveling minstrel named Esme in her search for a missing companion. The companion, Tara, was always having trouble with what she called the Black Fog, which is likely either directly or at least an analogy for chronic depression. While following the leads, it becomes apparent that she fell in with what seems to outside observers to be a bad cult. Esme becomes more frustrated as the information is unraveled until we find the cult's final resting place, and Tara's among them. All know that feeling. Everything is going to be all right. Fear is a phantasm conjured by our own mind. You are afraid of a pain that won't come. She promised. Tara! What is it that you fear? I don't know. Death? You are afraid of dying. But that is not what will happen. None of you will. On the contrary, you will become part of something greater. You are not here because I forced your hand. You never were. You are here because, for once in your life, you want to do something with purpose. Something that matters. Our mark on the world offers a perspective we rarely see in depression stories. The perspective of the loved ones that the depression hurts. When we meet Esme, she's already frayed at the edges. It's clear how much she regrets losing Tara and how much she blames herself. She was always worried that Tara's fate was her fault, because she could never really help her with the Black Fog. But what makes the quest truly unique is that for both of the observers of Tara's fate, it means something different, because for the player, what seems like a pointless death may have had a deeper meaning. At the beginning of Enderal's story, the player encounters an entity only called the Veiled Woman. Almost no one in the game knows anything about the Veiled Woman, so it stands out as a unique quest by that alone. The cult members are conducting this ritual because, like Tara, they wanted to do something that matters. They wanted to use the lives that they thought were so pointless in a way that left a mark. The Veiled Woman was that mark. And to us, the player, there's a chance that these sacrifices may help to power one of the greatest forces within the world of Vin. Whether that's a worthy cause or not, we will never know. All we know is that the god the cult worships is real, and that Tara's sacrifice held meaning even if Esme couldn't see that. But none of that changes how Esme feels about Tara. And why would it? Enderal's quests are not generally stories about happy endings, but they are stories about hope. Hope that even against all odds, the things we did in life meant something. Even if our tiny lives mean nothing, there's still a chance that we changed the future, as insignificant as we were. Unlike Bethesda's quantity over quality take on companions, Enderal takes a more direct approach. Characters do remember your actions, and these ones in particular will get to know you as the quests continue. That's something I should also get out of the way. 
Each companion in Enderal is with you for the duration of a quest, and they are a major part of those quests. Our mark on the world is actually one of these, with more characters crammed into Esme's runtime than you can shake a stick at. For the main quest, we actually have two companions to choose from, though they're more of their own people than Skyrim's companions. They have their own schedules and don't follow you everywhere. They're people who you found by coincidence who you happen to get to know. You've already met Jespar, the charming mercenary that rescued you after a near-death experience. You seem to have a lot of those. Jespar is witty, charming, and isn't against one-night stands if you're both interested. But he's also apathetic and hides many of his true feelings behind that charming mask. When things start to get rough, he's known to run, regardless of what he leaves behind. He hates himself for the people he's hurt, but is too much of a coward to fix those relationships. Finally, his view on justice is twisted and broken due to the past shattered by actions of his father, who was a steadfast judge who stuck to his ideals. And that's just Jespar. Kalia is no less complicated. Found in a forest as a child, she struggles with a literal internal demon. <laughs> Stuck in a mental struggle in which she can't allow herself to fail, she nonetheless maintains her sense of right and wrong. She asks you questions that are difficult to answer and may not even have a correct answer. Uncovering her past leads to the dark secrets about the very world the game takes place in, and Kalia will push you away more often than she wants to in order to keep you safe. Her personality is that of someone who wants to love others but can't bring herself to open up because of the danger she views herself as. Finding a way to allow her to love herself is the key to her transformation. Both of these characters are beautifully written, and it's not surprising that a version of Jespar even becomes the focal character of a spin-off book, now in its own universe. Definitely give Dreams of the Dying a read, by the way. It's out on Audible now and was a constant companion while I was playing through Enderal again. Okay, so a disclaimer before I get into Enderal's story. This is what you play Enderal for. While I'm not going to spoil it in its entirety, I will need to go into the very, very basic strokes of it to talk about the endings, as well as spoiling the endings themselves, of course. This is a game that has had thousands of development hours put into it, and it shows. Normally I only give spoiler warnings at the beginning of my videos, so take me seriously when I say this. If you want to play Enderal, now is your time to close this video and go and do so. I've completed this game from start to finish twice and it deserved every moment of it. Now that that's done. Enderal's story is massive and it took me several months to get through. The broad strokes of it are that you're an important figure called an emissary, one of the harbingers of the end of the world called the cleansing. As the prophet emissary, you can see the past cycles of the world and try to use that to prevent this cleansing. The cleansing is brought about by the High Ones and can be stopped by a machine known as the Beacon. Most of the story is an attempt by you and your allies to rebuild and light the Beacon, destroying the High Ones once and for all. I won't go into detail, but it doesn't end well, and it turns out that this is all part of a cycle that is being retreaded time and time again, with the emissaries as the guarantee that it would fail. You step out of the last dungeon of the game knowing two things. That you've lost, and that your chances to win were almost non-existent in the first place. The world ends around you as all of the major players of the performance lie dying on the ground. Some are already dead. One of your friends lays dying, while the man you most trusted stands at the machine that was supposed to save the world, his blindness and pride having destroyed it. You are left with a few choices. You can run for another better tomorrow, and try to save those things that are most precious to you. You can act to push back the end at the cost of your own life. Or you can take both pills and hope for a better outcome. Let's take a look, shall we? Catharsis. In this ending, you return to the beacon and break the stones that power it. Along the way, you discover the other companion that was left to defend it, dying near the machine. A massive hole has appeared in the sky and the souls of all those who died are slowly floating into it, beginning the formation of the newest High One. 
Breaking the stones causes a massive explosion, and you are dragged back into the same recurring nightmare that you've been having all game. This time, though, you are dead, and all that remains of you and your family are the tombstones in front of the house. Once you touch them, you hear a monologue from your love interest, talking about how your sacrifice allowed the world to begin fighting the High Ones again with a massive advantage. You died, and while you didn't escape the cycle, you left the next one with the information they needed to do so. A great philosopher once said that every change begins with a moment of lucidity. In these moments, a veil opens, one which normally shrouds all the unwelcome truths we are aware of, but which we have buried deep within ourselves where we cannot see them. And it is only these moments in which we can make a decision, the decision to either act or to let the moment pass, until the veil seals itself again and we once more are the slaves of our habits. I don't believe in revolutions. They're too simple, too fiery, and they too often end with the opposite result of what was intended. But neither am I a cynic who has lost all of his faith in the world. Change is possible, but it won't come as a big bang, but rather as a long path, one that will constantly confront us with obstacles. Obstacles we can either choose to overcome, or at which we can choose to quietly turn around and go back to being what we were. The sacrifice of the one who will be remembered as the prophet is proof that I am right. Yes, some might see the downfall of Enderol as the triumph of the High Ones, but it wasn't. It was neither that nor a triumph for mankind. What we were granted was a moment of lucidity, the chance to start our own walk down a long, rocky path. The High Ones exist because we believe in them. We. Our egos give them their power. And the more we listen to their words, the more we hate them, and the more powerful they become. Indeed, the beacon, this ancient machine of unknown origin, can destroy us, but it can also free us from the High Ones, if we use it right. Rumors that the Arizalians have started constructing a second beacon, and the knowledge that this time we are aware of its nature, give me hope that the man I loved, the Prophet, has not died in vain, and that we continue walking. Brave New World results in you and your loved one escaping the disaster to a flying star city, it's a long story, to serve as the new gods of the next cycle. The High Ones are supposedly given power by the humans that see them as enemies. The stronger humans think they are, the more dangerous they become. The intended reasoning for choosing Brave New World is that you and your love interest will guide humanity towards a future where the High Ones never truly gained this power in the first place. How we expect to do that is left unsaid. Here, the dream is still present, and happens just after you and your companion lift off into the Star City's escape pods. Again, you approach your family's home. Just as you reach it, though, something stops you, and you see an echo of your beloved. Following them, you eventually wake up from the dream. You join your companions, staring off into the clouds. Comments are made about how little the world seems to care about your fate, and how the future is now up to both of you. Hey. I don't know. When I woke up, we were here. You were still unconscious, so I took the liberty of carrying you into that room. Just look at that. From here, it all seems so peaceful, untouched, as if all that's happened was nothing but a bad dream. I guess as far as the world's concerned, it doesn't make a difference if we live or die. <sighs> now it's up to us.
This ending is related to the player's discovery and use of a potion called the Dream Flower Elixir. I won't tell you how to get it, because it is a secret. What I will tell you is that the potion's expected effect is to move the player to an alternate reality with the best outcome. During the main quest, you are also told by another experienced mage that what it actually does is place you into a perfect dream where you no longer have any control of your actions. Yes, the dream flower improves your arcane skills, but it neither makes you immortal, nor does it allow you to seamlessly jump between realities. Instead, it puts you into an eternal slumber. You understand? Simply knowing this drastically alters the meaning of this ending. Couple this with this ending's achievement, what's reality anyway, and it really makes you wonder. And now we're back to how we started. If you were presented with an inevitable end of the world seconds away, what would you do? It's by taking these decisions seriously that we learn a little bit about how we as individuals view our world. Enderal's mantra remains in our heads. We don't matter. But what it leaves out and hopes for us to find ourselves is that while we don't matter, our legacies do. In every desert, there's a black grain of sand among a billion others. What do you mean? Every battle is a new chance. Nobody knows if man will ever overcome his nature, but one day he might. You can go and be yet another meaningless drop of water in the stream of existence, or you can do something that matters. The choice is yours. Even if we die, nothing, not even time, can permanently erase our existence. Even the grains of sand we move while walking are in a slightly different position due to our passing. And that, in itself, is proof of our worth. And if we can alter the future with our mere existence, what can all of us do if we choose to? What can a united people accomplish in this insane world that gives us a semblance of free will? We don't know. But we do know that we, individually, are nothing. But we, as a collective, are everything. My choice is always the same. It's always catharsis. Enderal's messaging hinges on letting go and moving on. For me, that means letting go of individual importance, but not individual pride. We understand that we as a species can still accomplish something as insane and hopeful as stopping the end of the world, but only if we give those that would carry the torch in the future a chance to live. And yet, Focusing too much on catharsis leads us to disregard the importance of the other two endings. Starting with Brave New World, we can gain a lot of perspective from two other characters that also chose this ending themselves. One of them is a major spoiler, so I'll talk about the other one here. The Aged Man. While you are an emissary, there's evidence that he was too. As each cycle turns, he continues to escape them each and every time, and despite his best efforts, he nonetheless fails to make a difference. No amount of preparation can allow one man to matter, but that never stops him from trying all the same. Like the aged man, you have the knowledge to accomplish a task that your own people failed at, and due to your foreknowledge of that failure, you can help those in the future to avoid it. As our predecessors found, though, you aren't stopping the inevitable, but postponing it. Yes, you escape the cycle, but eventually you will always have to confront it. Putting off reality doesn't mean it stops existing. It will always be there, waiting for you, because it can wait forever while you can't. But it does give you the chance to learn how to confront it in the future. And then there's the matter of the fate of your companions. Once again, the aged man becomes relevant. When we visit him, we discover that he eventually had to put his beloved into a form of stasis. Despite his name, he does not age and she does. Brave New World may allow your companion to escape the fire of the cleansing, but it leaves them stranded on an empty world with no one other than you. Eventually, they will grow old, and eventually, your bond will be tested. It's another point where you are asking them to trust that you made the right choice because it's a choice that's irreversible within their lifetime. 
Even then, they will never live long enough to see the results. But you can't see the future, only the past. Will they see it the same way? And then we come to the dream flower ending. While at first this ending seems to be the happiest, there's always the strange hint of doubt here. Is this real? Is this the best outcome? Taking the dream flower elixir could actually put you on the best timeline, but it could always be an illusion. What I find fascinating about this ending is how it affects different people. When asked why they would choose the dream flower ending, some would say, I want to be happy. And it's definitely the best outcome in that case. Not only are you alive, but you don't inflict your death on those who would grieve for you, and it allows them to maintain their freedom of choice, unlike the Brave New World ending. However, due to that constant doubt, it's not a world that I could ever be happy in. I'm a person who values both the successes and failures of the world to give context to either outcome, and a world without any failures is a hellscape to me. This ending, at least for me, represents denial. It allows us to ignore reality and focus on the things that make us happy. But the moment we start to think about what that reality is, it all starts to break down. Because you're not in control anymore. You can't escape the world. And you will always carry the memories of the other world with you. Dreams have always had an important part in the story of Enderal. The lead writer, Nicholas Lietzau, elaborated on why they're so present in his works. For him, dreams were a constant companion as he had started life as a lucid dreamer. This helped him to lend a real sense of surrealness to these sequences, and it's also why Enderal starts off the way it does. These dreams are your subconscious trying to get your attention, and it's in direct opposition with what your conscious mind is being told. In the waking world, you're one of the emissaries, one of the chosen few with the ability to save the world. But inside, where you can't escape it, you're worthless. Disobedient. A murderer. Killer of your own family. These are what nightmares are made of. When you start Enderal, you get a sense that your character is not a blank slate. They have baggage, and it's slowly eating away at them. There are times when this baggage comes out. Daddy appears in unexpected locations and does unexpected things. Even up until the end, there are times where you're not sure if you're in your own reality. Your dreams won't leave you alone, because ironically, they're trying to wake you up. There's something wrong with your character, and Daddy won't let them forget it. It's story time. There once was a happy family, two children, a husband and a wife. The husband was very pious and made sure to share his piety with the whole family. Eventually, his piety turned to suspicion, and he began to accuse his wife of bearing a child with another man. He beat her, complaining about all the work he did to put all the food on the table. Times grew hard, but somehow Daddy always had food for you. He would always serve the table with a nice, crisp piece of meat. And eventually, you too became suspicious. Where was Daddy getting all of this meat? One night, Daddy beat Mommy so hard that you ran and got the temple guard. They came to stop him. But when they got there, they opened the larder and found all of the meat. The meat was from people. Horrified, the temple guard burned your home to the ground, allowing only you to escape. After an experience like that, of course you don't want to talk about it. As the story progresses, you've been processing all of this, remembering all of it, and slowly integrating it into your view of the world. Each dream comes near a conversation with the High Ones, as if opposing their influence. Because they most certainly are influencing you. Your character is dead. They are an illusion that's so convincing that they think they're alive. In assuming the role of the emissary, they also assume the role of a fleshless, one of the tools of the High Ones. In the very last moments of your time on Vin, 
You understand that you have been the instrument of the end of the world from almost the moment you were in control. And these dreams have been trying to pull you out of that illusion in their own twisted way. At the very end, the dreams reflect how we finally deal with the traumas of our past. At the very end, we finally achieved our one true goal, to be free. And with that freedom, we make the only choice that matters, what we will do with our life. In Catharsis, we see the tombstones and confront them. We decide that we're done running from our past and decide to meet the future, regardless of what it costs. It costs us our life, but we still manage to leave our mark on the world. We step aside so that others can come after. The choice we make is given to those that follow. In Brave New World, we follow our loved ones away from our problems. They become our shield and our strength, and in them we find value in ourselves. The trauma is still there, but together you can hide it a little longer for their sake. You can put off the inevitable by the strength of your bond, and in doing so find the strength to confront it in the future. And finally, in the Dreamflower ending, we failed to do either. Without the strength to face even reality, our traumas sink into our psyche like a thick sting. Our past will always be a part of us, and no amount of denial can convince us otherwise. Here, we drank the Kool-Aid and accepted the false life. Now, we live with both. You can't hide from your own mind. This is the ultimate denial. Your failure to wake up. It should be noted that these are, of course, my own interpretations. I've seen many others, and it's hard to say if any of them are really correct. If you yourself have your own feelings about the endings, and the attached dreams, we can discuss them below in the comments. As it is, though, all of these dreams reflect a style of coping with trauma, and they are represented in-game through the companions that have been with you during this entire journey. It's frequently assumed that each companion has their own ending, with Kalia's being catharsis, self-sacrifice, and Jespar's ending in Brave New World, self-preservation. In fact, it's possible that the whole reason that these companions exist is to give a perspective that may choose either of these endings. If that's indeed the case, then whose ending is Dreamflower intended for? Well, it's possible that it's intended for the player, and whether you see this as a trap or a way out is up to you. Something that complicates this even further is that the Dreamflower ending was only added with the final version of the game, Forgotten Stories. However you view it, all of these endings are equally valid and are part of why I can't stop thinking about Enderal. <laughs>